In this video, we're going to look at the superior surface of the base of the skull. So here we have the superior surface of the base of the skull. And we can see that it's made up of a series of bones. Now these bones are bilateral, so we have them on both the left and the right side. So looking at this base of the skull, then we can start from the anterior aspect, and if we work posteriorly, we can identify the specific bones. So most anteriorly on the base of the skull, we find we have the frontal bones, both the left and the right. In between the frontal bones, we have the ethmoid bone, which has the projection superiorly of the crystagali. This is important in attaching the superior sagittal sinus. And either side of the crystagali, we have the cribiform plate. We'll come back to that later on. So the frontal bone, and then we have the ethmoid in between. Working posteriorly, we find we have the sphenoid bone, we can have the body of the sphenoid bone, and we can also have a lesser wing. So we have a lesser wing of the sphenoid bone here, and we have another one on the right-hand side. The lesser wing of the sphenoid bone projects posteriorly and forms this anterior clinoid process. So here we have an anterior clinoid process, and we also have another one here on the left. We then have this dip which is part of the sphenoid bone, it comes posteriorly and it dips down. From anterior to posterior, this ridge we see here is known as the tuberculum cella, and then we have this dip, which is the hypophyseal fossa. This is important in housing the pituitary gland. We then have this sharp superior projection, which is the dorsum cella. This is all part of the sphenoid bone. Coming from the dorsum cella, we have a posterior clinoid process here, and we also have one on the left-hand side. Radiating more posteriorly and projecting inferoposteriorly, we have the clivus, and running up here, we'd have the pons and the basilo archery. So if we return to our sphenoid, then here we have the lesser wing and the anterior clinoid process. We also have a greater wing, which we can see laterally. If we move lateral to the greater wing of the sphenoid, we can then find the temporal bone, which I've outlined here. And the temporal bone actually has two parts to it. It has a squamous part, which is flat, and a petrous part. The petrous part is important as it contains the inner ear, so the labyrinth and the cochlea. So here we can see the petrous part of the temporal bone, and here we have the squamous part. Going superior from the temporal bone, we then find the parietal bone. If we travel posterior from the petrous part of the temporal bone, we then find we have the occipital bone. And here we can see the left portion of the occipital bone, and here's the right. Clearly we have this large foramen, which is the foramen magnum. We can also divide the base of the skull into fossae, either an anterior, a middle, or a posterior fossa. So here we have the anterior cranial fossa. It's made mostly of the frontal bone. And if we move posteriorly from the anterior cranial fossa, we then find the middle cranial fossa. The middle cranial fossa extends from the lesser wing of the sphenoid bone across to the opposite lesser wing. And from here we have the anterior margin of the middle cranial fossa. The middle cranial fossa then includes the tuberculum cella and the hypophyseal fossa, and it also includes, as we'll detail later, the optic canal, which we can see here. The middle cranial fossa is important as it contains a series of foramina which allow the passageway of important blood vessels and cranial nerves to pass through. So here we have the middle cranial fossa. The posterior limit of the middle cranial fossa is this ridge that runs alongside the petrous part of the temporal bone. So here we can see this ridge which separates the middle cranial fossa from the posterior cranial fossa. The most prominent feature of the posterior cranial fossa is going to be the internal occipital protuberance, and here would be where the confluence of the sinuses is located, the superior sagittal sinus and the straight sinus draining here. And then within the posterior cranial fossa, as part of the occipital bone, we can then see the groove for the transverse sinus, and we can also see the groove for the sigmoid sinus as it heads towards the jugular foramen. So again, we have the internal occipital protuberance, 
Here we have the transverse groove for the transverse sinus, and here we have the groove for the sigmoid sinus as it leads to the jugular foramen. So now let's work through these foramina and work out which cranial nerves or important blood vessels pass through them. So if we start most anteriorly, then we have the cribriform plate, and on both the left and right side of the cribriform plate, we have a series of small holes, and these allow the olfactory cranial nerves to pass through. By passing through here, they then enter the nasal cavity. Working posteriorly, we can see just on the medial aspects of the anterior clinoid processes, we can see the optic canal. Passing through the optic canal is clearly going to be the optic nerve, which receives sensory information from the eye. And also to supply the eye, we have the ophthalmic artery, which passes through the optic canal. So we can see the optic canal here, and obviously we have one on the right-hand side here. If we look underneath the anterior clinoid process, we can also see this kind of elliptical-shaped foramen, and this is known as the superior orbital fissure. So here we can see the superior orbital fissure. The superior orbital fissure is important. It allows the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal to pass through, so V1 passes through here. Also the nerves to the extraocular muscles, so the trochlear nerve the oculomotor nerve and the abducent nerve all pass through here. If we then move posteriorly to the superior orbital fissure, we then find we have a rounded foramen, and this foramen is known as foramen rotundum. This foramen is also important as it allows the maxillary division of the trigeminal to pass through. So V2 passes through the foramen rotundum. Again, working posteriorly, and we find the foramen oval. This oval-shaped foramen allows the third division of the trigeminal, so the mandibular division of the trigeminal, to leave the skull. It also allows the lesser petrosal nerve to pass through. So here we have three foramina that allow the three divisions of trigeminal to pass through. The superior orbital fissure for the ophthalmic division, the foramen rotundum, for the maxillary division, and the foramen oval for the mandibular division. If we look medial to the foramen oval, then we also see this foramen here, and this is known as the foramen lacerum. Now this foramen doesn't actually allow a great deal through. It's mostly filled with cartilage in the wet skull, but in the dry skull this cartilage is obviously not present. It's important as lying posterior to the foramen lacerum is the carotid canal. And the carotid canal is where the internal carotid artery runs across to then travel superiorly to form the circle of Willis. We'll come back to the carotid canal later on when we look at the inferior surface of the base of the skull. So here within the middle cranial fossa we have a series of foramina that allow the trigeminal nerve roots to leave and also the carotid canal which allows the internal carotid artery to pass. A final foramen is within the middle cranial fossa here, and that is the foramen spinosum. The foramen spinosum allows the middle meningeal artery and vein to pass through. If we then move posteriorly into the posterior cranial fossa, we can then see a largish foramen within the petrous part of the temporal bone, and this is the internal acoustic meatus. The internal acoustic meatus allows two cranial nerves to pass through, that is the facial nerve and the vestibular cochlear nerve, cranial nerves 7 and 8. Just inferior to the internal acoustic meatus, we have a large foramen, and this is the jugular foramen. It allows three cranial nerves to pass through, cranial nerve 9, 10 and 11. So that's the glossopharyngeal, the vagus and the accessory nerve passes through this jugular foramen. Also starting from the jugular foramen is the internal jugular vein. And the internal jugular vein is continuous with the sigmoid sinus, which passes along the groove for the sigmoid sinus on the occipital bone. And as the sigmoid sinus passes through the jugular foramen, so it becomes the internal jugular vein. Slightly medial and inferior to the jugular foramen is the hypoglossal canal. This just allows one cranial nerve to pass through, that is cranial nerve 12, the hypoglossal nerve. 
And then we have the large foramen on the base of the skull, and this is the foramen magnum. Foramen magnum is important. It allows the medulla to pass through the continuation of the spinal cord superiorly. It also allows the vertebral arteries to enter into the cranial cavity, the spinal roots of accessory nerves to pass in and out of the cranium, and also the meninges follow the central nervous system down towards the spinal cord through the foramen magnum. So briefly, we've just looked at the main foramina that are within the base of the skull the cribriform plate, the optic canal, the superior orbital fissure, the foramen rotundum, the foramen ovale, the foramen spinosum, the foramen lacerum, and the carotid canal, the internal acoustic meatus, the jugular foramen, the hypoglossal canal, and the foramen magnum. If we were to turn the skull around, so we're looking at the inferior surface, then if we just excuse this spring which is present to help keep the mandible in position, then here we can see we have a similar arrangement of foramina. Most immediately here we can see the foramen lacerum again, and importantly, immediately lateral to the foramen lacerum, we have the foramen ovale. The foramen ovale important in allowing the mandibular division of trigeminal to come through. So here we can see the foramen lacerum, which remember would be full of cartilage, and here we can see the foramen ovale. If we work posterior from here, we can see a couple of small spines. These are the spines of the sphenoid bone, here and here, so the spines of the sphenoid bone. Here we have the mandibular fossa, which allows the articulation with the condyle of the mandible. And medial to the mandibular fossa, we can have the beginning of the carotid canal. So what you can see here is the beginning of the carotid canal. And what happens, the internal carotid artery enters the carotid canal. It then travels anteriorly along the canal, which we saw on this superior view. So here it's now running along the canal. It runs over foramen lacerum, which remember is filled with cartilage, to then travel superiorly to form the circle of Willis. So let's go over that once more. Here we can see we have the carotid canal. So the internal carotid artery enters in this direction. It then runs anteriorly along the carotid canal to then travel superiorly to form the circle of Willis, when it lies over the foramen lacerum. So foramen ovale, the foramen lacerum here, here's the carotid canal. Posterior to the carotid canal, we can see the jugular foramen. Lateral to the jugular foramen, we can see the styloid process. Lateral to the styloid process, we have the mastoid process. And here we can have a small foramina, and this is known as the stylo-mastoid foramen. This is important as it allows the facial nerve to leave the skull. We saw the facial nerve pass into the internal acoustic meatus. It then works through the petrous part of the temporal bone to leave the skull via the stylomastoid foramen. And here again in the midline, we can see the foramen magnum. So this is the main foramina that form the base of the skull. These are important as they allow blood vessels and nerves to leave and enter the cranial cavity.